Uh, Father Ron Rollheiser, it's an honor to have you today here for this interview and really want to welcome you to this dialogue. We're going to be talking today just about the school and your contributions and what you've done. Maybe what we could start with is I know you were here as the president of the school when this Spirituality Institute was launched. Could you tell us a little bit about how this came to be, this program and this institute? Yes, because actually I was brought here for that reason. And so I was brought here with, you know, to to administrate the school. But but primarily the, the agenda was that I would start a spirituality program, which would culminate with a with a PhD in spirituality. So we started with uh, the grassroots with um, continued education. We brought in an MA and then um, uh, took about four or five years till the ATS finally accredited us for for the PhD. And now we also have a an arm or that or a, a component in the DMIN program as well. So this ended up coming together, I believe, in 2013, was mm -hmm. the first yeah. cohort of PhD students. So the intent was to really dig into and study academic spirituality. Could you define for us, when you think of what is academic spirituality, well, how would you define that? Well, the, the definition has been controversial, but I'll give you the, I think which is a good definition, compliments to Sandra Schneiders and others. Um, it's really the, the, the academic investigation of spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can be done through an interdisciplinary lens, you know, um, which then makes it more of an, uh, a project in religious studies. You know, you can study, and it can be done through a, a particular lens like Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism. And then it becomes more of a theology because it's done from within. So that kind of distinguishes, you know, strict religious studies from a theological discipline. But they're both academic. So with spirituality, there's a lot of conversation today about people interested in the concept of spirituality. Clearly, there's a lot of different definitions, but when you think about spirituality and how you define actually spirituality itself, what definition would you give? Okay, I'm gonna give you a definition that doesn't sound academic, but it can be phrased academically, it is. And that is, for instance, it's an analogy to a game. Take, take soccer. Okay, soccer has a set of rules, okay? And those rules are very important. That's the playing field, but it's not the game. When the two teams face off, that's a game. See, so strictly speaking, theolo theology or religious studies, you know, but theology for Christians, that's the rule book. Mm. You know, it's scripture, it's, it's your church traditions, it's do defined dogmas. That's the field you have to play on. But notice, that's not the game. The game is still individual discipleship and collective discipleship in our churches. You know, they're, they're living out discipleship and see spirituality is that. So spirituality is, how, how are we actually living this out inside of all those roles and inside of scripture and so on? Um, I think more classically in Protestant or evangelical circles, this would be called discipleship, you know? Um, Catholics have called it the spiritual life, or, or today we kind of have a, the, the word spirituality, which covers the, the whole gamut. So that's interesting. So if spirituality is the game, it makes sense to study the rules to the game, uh -huh. right? So why we would study spirituality would make sense. But why study how you play the game? Very important. And, you know, and I'll start pastorally. That's the difference between a good, deep spirituality book and a self-help book. Mm. See, see, it's very important that um, that when you when you um, write about spirituality and study uh, write about it particularly and give that you know the rules, you know, and you're also not just the rules, but you're also coming out of a out of a deep well of see Christianity. We're two thousand years old. And we have deep wells of mystical experience of uh, you know, different saints, of theologians. And you know, um, the wheel doesn't have to always be reinvented, but I mean, you, you can draw inspiration from that. Um, and, and that makes the difference between a deep book, a deep book in spirituality, or the great spiritual writers, and somebody who writes a pretty good book, but you know, it's the, the seven habits of, <laughs> of successful Christians. Yeah. So you see a lot in academic circles 
all these you know theologians who are studying all these different aspects of theology i know one of the things you and i've talked about is spirituality has an opportunity to unite where sometimes theology can create division within how we see christianity and our traditions could you speak a little bit about that how does spirituality work in a way that studying it and focusing on it actually draws us together from our tribalism well i can speak to that theoretically i can speak to it practically from our experience. Theoretically, see, um, theology are the rules of the game in church life and so on. And there's a discrepancy in the rules between yeah. Catholics, Protestants, Evangelicals, so on. Um, but spirituality is focusing on how am I living this out? And oftentimes there's wonderful consensus and a lot of the problematic areas in theology don't come up. You know, and we can pray together, worship together, search for truth together, and so on. Um, and in fact, I'm glad you brought that, brought that up because I think that's one of the key roles of spirituality. The churches are going to, we're going to reunite around spirituality, mm -hmm. you know, because it takes us beyond our differences and not just beyond our differences, it takes us to what we're both commonly, all commonly searching for, you know. But but the practical thing is, and, and you've, you're part of that experience. We've done this for 10 years. We have people from every denomination. In 10 years, we haven't had a single conversion from one denomination to another. But every student, and that's without an exception, every student has left here with a much deeper love of their own tradition mm. and a much deeper appreciation of all other traditions. I would say our work is done. Our okay. Is done. okay. <laughs> right. So maybe you could speak a little to that experience with what you see even in our MA and PhD program. More specifically, I know myself coming out of more of a Stone Campbell tradition and coming to a Catholic school. It was one of the questions I had. So do you see a lot of diversity in the student population here um, of people coming from these different traditions and how that engagement works? Yeah, I, I see that the, you know, the people coming in the engagement, and I think you probably could speak to that from experience too. I think initially we have to struggle sometimes with each other's language. Mm -hmm. the, you know, coming up, you know, the, the language of some of the mystics can be pretty quaint for an evangelical, or, or sometimes their language can be quaint for me. I know being with the program for 10 years, it's been a wonderful learning experience for me because when I came here, uh, coming out of Western Canada, I, I didn't have, I didn't have a, any kind of rich experience of the evangelical tradition. I had new Catholics, Protestants, and so on. And that's been one of the really enriching experiences of my own life in the last 10 years. That's one of my favorite stories to tell about my experience here was the first Christmas that I was in the program in December of 2017, I believe. And you told me as I was heading home for Christmas, when you go home, you have to remember, um, we're not trying to convert you to become Catholic. We want you to take what we're teaching you back to your tribe, your people. Yes. I always appreciated that. It's one of the things that's been special for me here. So for you in how you would frame how Ron Rollheiser has contributed or what role he plays to the field, what would you say is your personal lens or angle when you do academic spirituality? What do you, what's your work been about? That I can best answer that by giving you the history, how I got into that. I trained first in philosophy, then I trained in systematic theology. I wrote my thesis in that area, and I was teaching systematic theology. And I was writing on the side. Um, but as the years went by, I just noticed that everything I'm writing is really spirituality more than theology. And more and more in my teaching, I wanted to veer in that direction. So I thought, I got to be honest here. Um, I like systematic theology, I like philosophy, but my field is spirituality. So I began to write in there, and, and through the years of, uh, uh, and I'm old, okay? So I've been, I've been writing for more than 40 years, and um, you know, I've written a newspaper column for more than 40 years every week, and I think there's like 6,000 columns or something, and there's about 10 or 15 books, but they're all in spirituality. Um, and I've gone through different phases. Earlier on, when I was young, my, most of my spiritual writing had to do with, you know, restlessness and the human spirit and um, Augustine's, you've made us for yourself, Lord. And then I had a middle period, 
with some of the books you're familiar with, where I began to write about faith and darkness, dark nights, you know, the shattered lantern. Um, and then more recently, just kind of grown with my age, I, I've, the last few years I've focused a whole lot on the whole process of aging, what that means, how we develop a theology of aging, um, theology of what Henry now used to say, to, to give your death away, to leave behind a spirit of peace, and so on. Um, those would probably be the three mega themes, you know, with a lot of other stuff. Um, you know, I did a book on suicide, I did a book on domestic monastery, I have just did a book on chastity, and, and, and those are kind of minor, important but minor titles in between but the three big movements are kind of human eros faith darkness and how do we exit this planet <laughs> right and uh, or how do we age gracefully and exit the planet so you've also had an opportunity to engage and interact with a lot of the students that have come through here theses that have been written yeah. etc could you explain how some of the students, especially in the PhD program, are integrating their work into the contemporary conversation? What kinds of things are happening here in this program? Well, in, in, in a double way. First of all, we, we have a good number of foreign students, Africa, Vietnam, so on. And they're not just integrating contemporary, they're integrating contemporary into their own culture. Right. So a lot of their thesis have to do with, you know, how is the image of women in Vietnam is related to this and scripture and so on, or in, in Africa. Um, but then here, in terms of the, the secularized world, and I mean, your thesis is an example, where, you know, um, um, where, where you, the whole contemporary issue, issue of how do we get beyond fervor? How do we sustain ourselves, you know, in desert experiences, wilderness experiences, and so on? You know, it's one thing, for instance, as a, as a minister or as a priest, to get somebody on fire. It's another thing to sustain that fire for 30 years right. through crisis and so on. You know, or one of our people did a, a wonderful thesis on uh, Charles Taylor and just the, what kind of imaginary issue, imaginaries are we searching for, for today's faith? Yeah. Or, um, it, you know, I just go on. You know, one, one of our graduates who's now teaching at Yale did a thesis on, which sounds almost, almost exotic, but deep and wonderful, how, um, you know, animals can sometimes help, you know, autistic people and others and so on. And what's the whole spirituality of that? Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have people working on theologies of soul. So um, um, it's very contemporary. Yeah. And it's, as you know, we're called an Institute for Contemporary Spirituality, but we don't want that to fool you because part of our advertising says, but coming out of the deep wells of Christian tradition. So, we, you know, we, uh, we want to land on a contemporary place, but we want to come up through, through the deep wells of Christian tradition. So again, that we're not writing books on just self-help books. Um, they're coming out of a deep, rich tradition. So let's pull on that thread a little bit. So studying the ancient tradition or the deep wells of our tradition, how does that specifically inform the contemporary scene? Why is that so important to do that work of really knowing the tradition and drawing from it? How does that speak to the contemporary setting? Well, uh, I'm, I'm gonna use a, maybe it's a cheeky metaphor, you know, it's a, we don't have to reinvent the wheel or rediscover fire, you know. See, you know, there are not just 2,000 prior to that and other scriptures. We have thousands of years of wisdom, of spiritual wisdom, not just in the Christian tradition, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and so on. So we have all this wisdom. Um, you know, if you're in any other field, if you're a scientist, you don't start from scratch, you know. Um, you're an architect, you don't start from scratch. You know, you, you or an artist, even you look at all art through history um, and see, and our task is not to imitate that, um, but our task is, those are shoulders we're standing on. See, so when you wrote your thesis, you're standing on a lot of shoulders, see, and because you're standing on the shoulders, you can see something they didn't see, uh, not because you're brighter, you're living later, and, and, and you're standing <laughs> on top of their work. And see, so that, um, you know, sometimes you have people who are just 
not so much in theology I mean, or the spiritual, that are just, they're powerful, creative, one in a billion genius, and they can just somehow, you know, the Mozarts and so on, you know. Um, the rest of us poor mortals, we, we have to build off somebody else's. Not imitatively, you know, like anything that's imitative is not creative, you know, and anything that's truly creative is not imitative, you know. So you're not imitating these writers, but basically you're, you're using them and their research and their experience. Um, you're standing on their shoulders as you're writing. So, so you're writing contemporary, but you're, you're coming out of that. So what's interesting about that then is as we progress in our development and our understanding of the human being, there would be a lot of apparently cross-disciplinary conversations that would add to our understanding, right, yeah. of spirituality. So is that an important part of studying contemporary spirituality, understanding what's happening in psychology, sociology, other soft sciences or social sciences? Would that play into how we engage this conversation? To the extent that that they're that without the human limitations like basically all those fields are so big mm -hmm. and first of all theology or spirituality is already a big field so for somebody to engage psychology or sociology or contemporary literature or art um, that's a whole other stretch and if a person can do that has the time the expertise that can be very rich mm -hmm. you know spirituality theology should always be trying to intermingle um, you know and uh, with the other sciences and learn and so on um, okay you wrote a thesis at a certain point how many books can you read <laughs> like, right I mean, where, where do you stop like someone says you question. should read the psychologist you should read this of course i should but that will be working 10 years from now it's just you know there's you're right but there's real human limits to what what you can accomplish you know not just time wise but even expertise not everybody it's the same expertise in psychology or sociology or you know um, the sciences are really important today with cosmology and you know the earth and um, you know I look at contemporary writers like Brian Swim um, you know or you know P Ilya Delio are writing about the universe and they're mixing it with with uh, the Big Bang Theory and so on um, that's all important but but we're all very limited in what we can so with the programs here, let's talk a little bit about the school yeah. and why would someone choose to study here? We have a PhD in spirituality. We have an MA in spirituality. We're launching a brand new certificate in spirituality this fall. But if you were to speak to a prospective student and say, what, why study at Oblate? Why would I come to do my work here? What would you say? Number of things. First of all, we're one of the pioneers of a PhD program, a doctoral program in spirituality. Okay, um, so we, we have a 10-year start. A lot of people are starting, okay. Um, we, we have some very, very, um, uh, we have some of the most renowned people in the area. So we have Philip Sheldrake, we've had Bernie McGinn here, we have Sandra Schneiders, we have uh, David Horan, we have Wendy Wright, and so on. That um, these, these are major names, um, you know, that, um, for instance, you were lucky enough mm -hmm. that um, some of these people are aging, are aging out now, that you can say, I studied with Sheldrake, with Schneiders, with Bernie McGinn, and so on. Um, if you go to an international conference on spirituality, which I did a couple years ago in 2018 in Rome, and there were like 34 major presentations. Well, Philip Sheldrake, Sandra Schneider, Bernie McGinn were the most quoted people from the, and our students were there. They said, we had them all as profs, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and we're trying to bring more people on side. We've just made some approaches to, to Doug Christie, you know, to, to um, who's, the, who's kind of the English expert on the whole desert father's mother's tradition. Um, so so I, I think we, we bring something to the table, um, 10 years of experience, but also those profs and, and also our, our particular ethos in terms of, you know, okay, I'm biased, but, but I think we, we've struck the right ethos between spirituality as not necessarily theology on one side and spirituality um, as not religious studies on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think we're, 
we're interchurch, interdenominational, and yet we're coming through a confessing tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, Carl Rano was Carl Rahner said theology needs to be done on its knees, otherwise it's religious studies. You know, here our spirituality program it's done inside of confessions, uh, and yet it's highly academic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and also I'm proud of our graduates. You know, like our graduates, every one of them has, is leaving a mark somewhere. So what encouragement would you give someone that was interested in learning more or thinking more about this? Would you have any words of encouragement to someone who's interested in this field? Well, this is gonna be a horrible analogy for some of but drug dealers give out samples. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I would say, you know, Audit the course. Sit okay. in the course online or whatever. You taste taste the product. Mm. I think that's what happened to you. That's exactly you what know, happened to me. You know, you, you you taste the product. Like, you know, ads and everything else. They have their value, but sometimes they can be slicker than the product. You know, right. You know, everybody's you know looked at a house and on on the the specs, and when you saw it, it wasn't as nice as the specs. So my thing is sample the product. You know, um, you know. Get online, take a course online, you know, see, see, see what you're getting. Yeah. Or if you're in the city, drop in on the course. It's a good analogy. It's exactly what happened. I remember in the fall of 2016, you invited me to sit in as an enrichment student on your course on John of the Cross. Yeah. And then you gave me another sample. You asked me to sit in on your contemporary spirituality class. Yeah. And then you talked to me about quitting my job and coming to school here. Yeah. <laughs> but it was good. So thank you so much for your time. It's always great to talk with you. Appreciate you sharing with us about the program and your life's experience. And we're grateful for all that you've contributed to the field. Thank, thank you. Thanks, David.